All right, if you have your Bible, open it up to the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 12. If you don't have a Bible and you need one, raise your hand, we'll get a Bible to you. You definitely want to have a Bible in your hand. You can also open up your YouVersion uh, Bible app on your smartphone or tablet and be able to follow along there as well. Nehemiah chapter 12, as we continue through our series, Studying Through Nehemiah. Uh, this, uh, just last week, uh, my, my family and I, we were uh, away, we were gone on, uh, out of town at a, uh, like an unexpected kind of a trip uh, to uh, take part in a, a funeral. Uh, and so, um, you know, we, we had to just you know, kind of leave sort of, sort of last minute, not really extremely last minute, but uh, I thank you for your prayers while we were gone and, and uh, just for praying for us as we were able to go and just be lights in a dark time. Um, and as I'm sure you've experienced similar times, it's important to have that in your life. And, and uh, we're just so grateful for you and the opportunity to uh, not only go and be ambassadors of Christ in other places, but to, to just come back and to be with you, to seek the Lord together. Just a, a sweet time of studying his words, singing his praise, enjoying genuine relationship with one another. It's, it's not something that you can just get anywhere. And I'm really grateful for us here at our church uh, as we uh, uh, pursue the Lord together. So Nehemiah 12 is where we're going to be at together today. Part of what we do is we just go through books of the Bible, and uh, as we're journeying through Nehemiah, there's a couple of chapters left, uh, and uh, we're in chapter 12. Now, the book of Nehemiah, just by way of kind of reminding us of where we're at and what's going on with Nehemiah, uh, Nehemiah tw uh, 12 is in the the last section of Nehemiah. And if you look at Nehemiah, it splits sort of evenly into two parts. The first six chapters really are all about rebuilding the walls. And then chapter seven is a transitional chapter. If you remember, that was the first chapter where we read a bunch of names. That was chapter seven. Uh, th there's, there were some names before that. It was the second list we found there. But it was this big chapter of names, a transitional chapter. And then chapters eight through 13 have the focus of rebuilding the people. Uh, and, and so there's this sort of uh, two things that are happening simultaneously within the book of Nehemiah. They're rebuilding walls, but they're also rebuilding uh, the people. And we've titled this section through Nehemiah, Godly Leadership That Revives and Rebuilds, because that encapsulates these two concepts. That there's rebuilding that takes place in terms of the, the actual physical structure. The city was in great disrepair, and a lot of work needed to be done in order to rebuild and repair the city. But also true, the people were in great disrepair, and they needed to be rebuilt as well. And so as we're looking through Nehemiah, that's what we're focusing on, that, that they needed to experience a revival here in this last section of Nehemiah from verses, uh, chapter 8 through the end of the book. And, and essentially, they needed this spiritual awakening. And if there's anything that I would say about us here today, we need the same. We need to experience a revival of the Lord. It's something that I'm praying that God would do. It's something that I'm expecting that God would do among us as his people uh, in our city, in our time, that we wouldn't just look back and say, look at what God did then, but that we could look at today and say, look at what God is doing now. And that happens as we as his people pursue him together. And so when we look at Nehemiah and these, this last section of the people being revived, of the people's lives being rebuilt, there's actually uh, three, three main things that they focus on. This is where it all centers around. And it's what we've seen and what we're going to be looking into today uh, is that they had uh, these three main things. Number one, the supremacy of God's word. That God's word wasn't just this thing that collected dust somewhere in a closet, uh, but that it was front and center, the focal point of everything that they, that they did, verses eight, or chapters 8 and 9 is what we found in that. And then also we saw that not only did they have the supremacy of God's word, but they had obedience to God's way. That's chapters 9 through 11. They decided God's word says this, and instead of trying to get God to do our thing, we're instead going to submit our lives to his thing. And so there's, there's this supremacy of God's word, this obedience to God's way. And today in chapters 12 and 13, we're going to be going into this next piece, which is the necessity of God's worship. That God, God, God's worship is a necessity for us. Not that God needs it, but that we need to give it to him. That, that God's not lacking something and we're, we're coming to him and he's just this arrogant God out in space saying, you need to come worship me because I need people to tell me how awesome I am and I, my, you know, my uh, self-esteem is pretty low. That, that's not God. He, he, we bring worship to him because we need to worship him. And that's what we're going to be looking at together today in uh, chapter 12 is this big idea that we do not choose whether we will worship, 
We only choose who we will worship. That's the big idea of, over chapter 12 in Nehemiah. So let's pray, and then we'll jump in and break it down together. So uh, let's pray to the Lord. Father, we thank you so much for today, God. We thank you for the opportunity to open your word together, and we pray that your name would be glorified in this place, that you would be exalted, that you would be seen as high and lifted up, and that we would simply draw near to you. Because we know that in coming near to you, our lives are transformed. And God, that's desperately what we need. We don't need to go through the, the motions of religious exercises. We don't, we don't need extra um, things to fill up our schedule. Uh, we, we need you to be exalted and lifted high. And, and as we draw near to you, your word tells us that you'll draw near to us that you're so faithful to be ready, that, that you are already pursuing us, and if we would just turn to you, we would find ourselves in your presence. And so, God, we turn to you even now, saying, would you be here among us? Give us open hearts and open minds and desire to pursue you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Today, as we look at uh, Nehemiah 12, we're going to look at it in two parts. And we're going to do it piece by piece because it's a large section uh, together today. There's 47 verses in Nehemiah 12. So we're going to do it in two parts. The first part, verses 1 through 26, a godly heritage. And then the second part, verses 27 through 47, a godly dedication. Now, we said that our, our big idea is that uh, we, we don't choose whether we will worship, we choose who we will worship. That's, that's just part of human design. Human design is that you've been created as a worshiper. Fish swim, prairie dogs dig holes, birds fly, cats are jerks, <laughs> cows taste great, and people worship, right? That's just the way that it is. That's just how it goes. That's just part of our native, those of you who are cat lovers are like mad at me right now, but everyone else knows what I'm talking about. All right, so uh, <laughs> the truth and the reality is that this is just part of our makeup and our design. We are worshipers. Now, you might be thinking, well, I'm not really worshiping anything with my life right now. And then what I would submit to you is that just because you don't think you're worshiping something, it doesn't mean that you are not worshiping something. We are perpetually worshiping someone or something. We cannot choose the if of worship. We can only choose the object of our worship. And the reality is that there are countless things grasping at your worship. Our world is filled with things that are count, count, uh, countless things that are consistently and constantly grasping for our worship, looking to pull it in and take us off of the thing that matters. And, and of all of the things that there are to worship, there are only four categories of things that you can worship, four, four categories of where all of this fits. And if you want a, a scripture reference for this, look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses tw uh, 2, I don't know if I said 12, Ephesians 2, 2 through 5. Uh, we're in Nehemiah 12, so I don't know. There's a, whatever. Ephesians 2, 2 through 5. Here, here are the four categories. The world, the, not the world like the planet. Well, I guess you could worship the planet too. That's part of it as well. But what I mean by that is the world system. That there's just a way that the world thinks and it's anti-God. It's apart from the Lord. There's just something about that. That you can worship at the altar of the world. You can worship at the altar of your own flesh. Uh, that there's this thing within you that desires what God says is wrong and you can worship at the altar of self. Whatever gratifies, glorifies me. There's also, you can worship at the altar of the devil. There's just satanic opposition pulling your attention away. And a lot of those altars uh, are, are of the devil. And, but also the fourth category and the category that I would submit to you is the only one worthy is you can worship Jesus. You can also worship him. Those are the only four categories of things in terms of what we worship. Now, you've got to know this. As we talk about the idea of worship today in Nehemiah chapter 12, you've got to know this thing before we jump into this, that worship is intimately connected to sacrifice. Worship is intimately connected to sacrifice. You will sacrifice for the things that you value. If you don't believe that, just take a look at your life. Just look at the things that you are willing to sacrifice for. You, you will give time for some things and you'll give excuses or reasons why you can't do other things. Uh, some of those things are good and, and you need to push them out of life. But there are other things that you're just, you're willing to sacrifice for. You're willing to give things up in order to make these things a priority. And what I would submit to you is that those are indicators of where your worship is found. 
Where is the, the stuff that you are worshiping? It's either going to be Jesus or it's going to be a pagan false god. Those are the only options. The world, the flesh, and the devil, all of that is pagan false gods. And Jesus is the true and living God. There are three areas that you can look at to evaluate your life to reveal where your worship is at. And they're intertwined with one another. Your time. Where do I sacrifice my time? Where does it go? When it's time to sacrifice that time, what does it go to? My talent. What do I sacrifice with my talents? What do I do in order to give my talents away and my treasure? Where do I sacrifice with my treasure? And as you evaluate your life and you look at those things, it's easy to see exactly what we, what we think is appropriate, what we think is where our uh, worship should go. And so here as we look at chapter 12, we're gonna look at this idea of sacrifice and worship and how they're intertwined together. So let's look at that first piece together, verses one through 26, and see what's taking place here. As, as we look at this, essentially chapter 12 is a chapter that is all centered around a huge national worship service of dedicating Jerusalem and the finished walls. And at the heart of all of this is the connection between worship and sacrifice. Look at verse one, it says this. Now, these are the priests and the Levites who came up with Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, Shariah, excuse me, Sariah, Jeremiah, uh, Ezra, <clears throat> Amariah, Maluk, Hattush, Shek uh, Shekaniah, Rehum, Merimoth, Edo, Ginnathoi, Abijah, Mijamin, Maadiah, Bilga, Shemaiah, Joarib, uh, Jediah, Shalu, Amok, uh, Hil Hil Hilkiah, and uh, Jediah. Uh, these were the heads of the priests and their brethren in the days of Jeshua. Now this, here what we see as, as we get into this is this is the fifth list of names that we find here in the book of Nehemiah. And it might seem like it's just a continuation of chapter 11, which is a massive list of names, but it's actually something different. Something different is taking place. If you look there at verse one, you'll see that there are two people named right from the beginning. It says, this is the, the are the priests and the Levites who came up with Zerubbabel and then also Jeshua. What this is, is these are referencing for us 100 years earlier than what's taking place right here. Zerubbabel was the guy who led the first wave of people out of captivity from uh, Israel into uh, captivity in the, uh, in the, from Babylon and the Persian Empire back into Israel. And so he, Zerubbabel was the guy that led them. He was the governor, just like Nehemiah is the governor of this time, uh, Zerubbabel was the governor of that time, about 100 years before. And so there were three waves that came back. Zerubbabel led one, Ezra led, led another one, and now Nehemiah is leading this, this third one. Also, Jeshua was the high priest of that time. And what we see here, and the thing that I want to pull out for us here, is that this idea of worship and sacrifice is this, this principle, that returning and rebuilding is a sacrifice of worship. That, that for you and for me, that as we think about the things of God and we return to the Lord and we bring our lives back to him, that by itself is an act of worship. The choice to say, I need to go back to the things of God. The choice that says, I need to rebuild the things in my life that have sort of fallen down. Those areas that have crumbled. I, I'm, just, I'm just not praying the way that I feel convicted that I should. I'm just not seeking the Lord in his word the way that I feel convicted that I should. I'm not serving the Lord with my time, talent, and treasure the way that I feel that I should, that God is leading me in things that need to be rebuilt. And when we return to the Lord and we rebuild, it's a sacrifice of worship. These guys had to go first and blaze the trail so that others could follow along. They were the ones who first stepped out because up until then, no one had returned and they decided that they would do this, that they would blaze the trail that others could follow. Now this path of blazing the trail comes with additional heartache because you don't have other people to look to. You don't have someone who went before you. You just look and you say, there's a bunch of work and trouble and heartache ahead of me. You don't have others to look back to for encouragement and example and support when you're the one blazing the trail. And some of you know what that's like. 
Some of you know intimately what that feels like. And maybe in your family, you're the one who says, I'm going to disrupt the generational curse and cycle of insanity, and we're going to follow Jesus. We're going to pursue him with all that we are. For, for Micah and me, that's our stance. That's where we are at. We're the ones forging ahead, blazing the trail in our family. We didn't inherit a godly heritage. We didn't inherit the, these, this uh, uh, generation upon generation of people who raised us in the ways of the Lord and who poured God's word into our lives. It's just not the way that we got it. We received the opposite of that. And so now we're the ones who are saying, well, we didn't get that but we're going to be the ones who blaze the trail forward. We're going to, we're going to return. We're going to rebuild. That's what we're going to do. And that comes with, with some heartache sometimes because you, you get to certain points where you get tired and you get discouraged and you think, gosh, why, is it, why didn't I have someone else to help me along with this? Why wasn't, why wasn't my father there to say, hey, son, this is how you pray. This is how you seek the Lord. This is what humility looks like. This is how you repent before God. This is what it's like to serve others. Why, why don't I have that? And I can, I, at that moment, I have a choice. I can either decide that I'm going to be a, uh, a statistic and I'm going to be someone who has, has been trampled upon and someone who doesn't have that. And I'm going to say, poor me, I wish I had that. And I'm going to be the victim or I can say, I will no longer allow that to define me. I'm going to serve the Lord. No matter what I inherited, I'm going to serve the Lord. And that's what these, these trailblazers do. They just move forward. And in Ezra chapter 3, we see uh, when we look back in, in the book of Ezra, that what they did was God used them to rebuild the, uh, the altar of sacrifice. This is where they rebuilt that altar of sacrifice to the Lord. Now look at, uh, in verses two through seven, what we have is a list of priests and Levites who came with Zerubbabel uh, and, uh, and they, they essentially helped set up all this priestly stuff. And Nehemiah, what he does is he looks back and he recognizes and honors the sacrifice of those who came before. You see, the truth, the reality is that all of us have somebody who's come before whether we can see it or not, whether we have had it in our, in our intimate family directly or not, there are those who've come before us. And it's vitally important for us to recognize that we are not standing on our own, but we're standing on the shoulders of those who have gone before. That the reason we are where we are is because someone else came before us and someone else pursued the Lord. And we can say, look, look at what God has done with them. And let's honor, let's love the past, but let's live the future. Let's look forward to what God has for us as we look ahead. You see, being able to see God's faithfulness yesterday gives you the confidence for, the day, for, for today and the courage for tomorrow. That we look back, not to dwell in the past, but to say, God, you've done this before. You've moved before. I'm excited about where you're leading us as we move into the future. Look at verse eight. Uh, verses eight and nine says this. Moreover, the Levites were Jeshua uh, Benui, Kadmiel, Sherebiah, Judah, and Mataniah, who led the Thanksgiving Psalms, he and his brethren, also Bakbukiah and Uni, their brethren, stood across from them in their duties. Here we also see that the Levites specifically led the people in something that they were doing, and it was the giving of thanks. That's specifically what they led the people in. They, were, they led the Thanksgiving. That thank, that's because Thanksgiving is a sacrifice of worship. That, that this is another principle of worship that we pull out. That, that gratitude has to do with where your attention is focused. That you can only be thankful if your attention is focused correctly. To give thanks, I must be willing to sacrifice my preferences and my expectations and see God's provision. It's kind of like this. You know, uh, maybe, maybe you've had this in your family. Maybe this was you in your family. Or maybe you're about to experience this in a couple of days. But you know, like when there's a, a, th this insanity that takes place on Christmas morning and there's like wrapping paper everywhere and, you know, there's all this stuff all around. And then, you know, there's this, this, this kid that's got this massive pile of loot that they've gained from this day, right? And they're, they're sitting in the middle of all of it. And instead of this joy and happiness, what do you see on their face? They're mad. They're disappointed because they didn't get something. Right? You look at it and you go, what is wrong with you? Look, at, you just got $5 million worth of stuff and you're mad? 
because you didn't get the razor scooter or whatever it was? Like, what in the world is going on? Because gratitude has to do with your, uh, where your attention is focused. And if you are focused on what you perceive that you don't have, then you're not grateful. Or you can shift your focus and you can thank God for what you do have, but you can't do both. You can't do both. You'll either be thankful for what you do have or you'll be unthankful or ungrateful for the stuff that you perceive that you should have. But you can't be in both. And, and, and if you ever are wondering, well, what do I have to thank God for? So let, let's just start with this. Let's just start with the cross. Let's just start there. Start with the fact that Jesus was willing to put on flesh and die in your place to secure for you eternal salvation. When you start there, when you start there, then you can be thankful for anything and everything else. Maybe even start being thankful for the stuff that you don't have that is bad. When you start listing those things, then it'll start to open your heart to the idea of thankfulness and gratitude. You ever wonder what God's will is for your life? I've wondered that. I love when the Bible tells me directly. Here's one of those verses. 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Be thankful in all circumstances for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Be thankful when? When I feel like it, when things are going great, when I got the raise, when I got a new car, when, no. Even when things are bad, even when things are difficult, even when you're going through trial, even when you're going through painful situations, being thankful to God because it has to do with where your attention is focused. Is your attention focused on the stuff that you wish you should have, that you think you are owed, or is your attention on what God has graciously gifted you with? You see, God's will for you is gratitude because it has little to do with what you have or don't have and has everything to do with your heart. An ungrateful, entitled heart is not cured. It's never cured by getting more stuff. You can't cure an ungrateful heart by getting more stuff. The only way that a, an ungrateful heart is cured is by starting to give thanks. When that starts to take place, it replaces and overtakes that ingratitude. Look at verse 10, it says this, Jeshua begot Joachim, Joachim begot Eliashib, Eliashib begot Joadiah, Joadiah begot Jonathan, Jonathan begot Jadua. Now the days of Joachim, the priests, the heads of the father's houses were Shariah, Mariah of Jeremiah, and Hananiah of Ezra, uh, Meshulam and of Amariah, uh, Jehoahan, Nun, of Meliku, uh, Jonathan of Shebaniah, Shebaniah, Joseph of Harim, Adna of Mer Merioth, uh, Helkiah of Edo, Zechariah of Ginathon, Meshulam, of Abijah, Zikri, the son of Minjamin, of Moadiah, Pialtiai, of Bilga, uh, Shamua, of Shemaiah, uh, Jeho Jehona Anathan, of Joya Rib, uh, Matanai, of Jediah, Uzi, of Salai, Kalai, of Emok, Eber, of Hilkiah, uh, Hashabiah and of Jediah, Nathaniel. During the realm of Dar uh, the reign of Darius or Darius the Persian, a record was also kept of the Levites and priests who had been heads of their father's houses in the days of Eliashib, Joadiah, Johanan, and Jadu Jadua, the sons of, uh, of Levi, the heads of the father's houses, until the days of jo Johanan, the son of Eliashib, were written in the book of the Chronicles. And the heads of the Levites were Hashabiah, Sherebiah, and Jeshua, the son of Cadmiel, with their brothers across from them to praise and give thanks, group alternating with group according to the command of David, the man of God, Mataniah, Bakbukiah, Obadiah, Meshulam, Talman, uh, and Akub were gatekeepers, keeping watch at the storerooms of the gates. 
These lived in the days of Joachim, the sons of Jeshua, the son of uh, Josadak, in the days of Nehemiah, the governor, and of Ezra, the priest, the scribe. Okay, this section, what we see here in verses 10 through 26 is that now we're getting to today, right? In the days of Nehemiah. We're going from the days of Zerubbabel and we're we're trailing it all the way through to today. They're tracing their lineage from the days of Zerubbabel and Jeshua to the days of Ezra, uh, who's the, the, uh, the priest uh, and scribe, Nehemiah, the governor, and Jadua, who is the high priest at that time. Now, in verse 22, what we see is that God preserves uh, his people and their records all the way through verse 22 through Darius or Darius, however you want to say that, the Persian, uh, this record is kept. God preserves his people and their records all the way through their captivity. Darius was of the Medo-Persian empire who took over after the reign of, uh, the, uh, of Nebuchadnezzar in the Babylonian empire. And if you want more about that, we did a really in-depth study through the book of Daniel. Uh, You can find all of that online and go through Daniel. And we talked through all of those things. Actually, through Daniel, there is a transition from the Babylonian Empire to the Medo-Persian Empire. And you can see all of that. Now, there are a couple of reasons why these records are valuable. One of them looks to the past and the other one looks to the future. As we see this, the records are valuable because one, especially with these Levites and these priests, this is how they proved themselves to be qualified for the job that the, the, the only thing that you could do in order to be qualified to be a priest or a Levite was be born into the right family. That's the only way. You couldn't wake up one day and say, you know what? I really like those priests. I think I'm gonna go get, go get some priestly duties. Like you couldn't do that. That's just not the way that it worked uh, in, in that time. You had to actually be born. In, yeah, some of you like that Nacho Libre uh, thing, but some of you were like, what? Um, anyway, <clears throat> um, you, you had to be born into that family. And in that, um, when you're born into that family, you had to be able to prove your lineage going back to your dad and his dad and his dad and his dad all the way back uh, into this tribe of Levi. That's why they're called the Levitical priests because it was from the tribe of Levi. That's why they're the Levites. Uh, and, and in this, so they had to be able to do that. Also, secondly, not only were they looking backward, but also it's to trace a record from uh, Adam, the, our first parents in the, in the Garden of Eden, to Abraham, the father of the faith, to David, to Jesus. That's the point of these genealogies, is to trace all of that as well. So one looks back and the other one looks ahead. In fact, when you open your New Testament, the very first book of the New Testament, the book of Matthew begins with a genealogy. Because that's the point. It's to get us to Jesus because he's the one that matters above all. He's the one who is exalted above all. He's the one that's the whole point. It's a scarlet thread woven throughout the Old Testament to get us to Jesus because he's our savior. He's our king. He's the one who steps into human history to save us and to rescue us. Now in verse 25, we see that there is a certain group that is named. Look at verse 25. It says this, um, These guys were the gatekeepers keeping watch uh, at the storerooms of the gates. What we see here is that um, sacrifice, uh, excuse me, service is a sacrifice of worship. Among all these other things, we pull out this principle here that service is is a sacrifice of worship. They were the ones keeping the doors and providing the the security. Now, that's not necessarily the most uh, exalted or prestigious position there is, right? Like when you, when's the last time you went into a really nice restaurant or into a a really tremendous uh, hotel and you remembered the guy at the door? Right? Nobody knows that guy or what his name is and nobody really cares because he just opens a door. That's all he really does, right? There's this thing about, you know, that he's just there to be that servant in that position and it's just this thing that's not really a prestigious job. And yet, what we see here is that these people are named because though it might not be a big thing to us, it might not matter to us, God says, I see, I look at your service, I look at what you're doing and it matters to me enough to where he writes their names, He actually writes their names. You see, you don't need to have the most spectacular position in order to serve the Lord and in order for it to be an act of your worship. You can serve the Lord with whatever he's given you right here, right now. 
that that is where we serve the Lord. In Psalm 84, 10, it says this, a single day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. Listen to this. I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God than to live the good life. I wish that was in quotes, the good life in the homes of the wicked, because it's not good. That's the point of this Psalm. It's not a good, it's, it may look good to the world, but he says, I'd rather be just this, this anonymous doorkeeper in the house of my God then live the good life out in the world. Sacrifice is given to God by what you're willing to do in your service to him. It's the practical, it's the menial, it's the unnoticed. It's the stuff that you do that nobody else knows about. It's the way that you just go about your life looking to honor the God in those everyday things. That when you're doing your dishes, you can honor the Lord in those things. That when you're changing that diaper again, you're, you can worship the Lord in that. You can serve the Lord in that. When you're, when you're handing out programs and welcoming people to church, when you make the coffee, when you set out the chairs, when you serve in the kids' ministry or any number of other things, you don't, you don't have to stand in front of everyone and read names that nobody can pronounce and try to teach the Bible in order to have a significant position within the church, in order to serve God. This is, this is one role of serving God, not the role of serving the Lord. You don't have to play uh, 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 some instrument and sing in order to serve the Lord. There are other ways to serve God and sacrifice him in worship, sacrifice to him in worship and service is a major way. All right, secondly, not only do we see uh, a godly heritage, but in verses 27 through 47, we get to the dedication itself and we see a godly dedication. Look at verse 27 with me, if you would. 27 says this, now, at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought out the Levites in all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate with the, uh, the dedication with gladness, both with thanksgiving and singing with cymbals and stringed instruments and harps. And the sons of the singers were gathered together from the countryside around Jerusalem, from the villages of the Netoth Netophathites, from the house of Gilgal, and from the fields of Geba and as. Uh, Asma, Asmaveth, for the singers had built for themselves villages around Jerusalem. See, here what we have happening is that the people connect today to yesterday and they celebrate their dedication. The dedication has this deep, impactful connection to the past. And they look back and they honor the past. In fact, the very last verse in this chapter reconnects all of this, naming Zerubbabel once again. And in this, singing was central to their worship. Do you see that there? That they're, the singing is a central component to their worship because singing itself is a sacrifice of worship. That joining my voice with the voice of others declares that God is great and I am not. Declares that God is worthy and I am not. That I'm going to come together with the, the, the congregation of God's people and lift high his name. You see, they gave a primary place to music and worship. They, they appointed musicians, they made instruments for them. They even, as we're, we're, we see here and we've seen before, they even paid the salary of the music, musicians so that they could live and serve the Lord in this way because they saw that music was a vital aspect to their worship. It wasn't a side issue. It wasn't just this thing that they did just because it was you know, kind of a nice idea. It was a central, vital component to worshiping God, which is why we give large place to music here at the church. It's not because I think that you need to, to be entertained or that you need to hear somebody sing some nice songs or because you know, we, just, we just really feel like you know, it, it helps people to set the mood or whatever. It's not that. It's because we, we're not here to sing songs for you. We're here to sing songs for the Lord. We're here to bring glory to his name and music is a, a primary way that that can happen. Psalm 100 verses one and two says this, shout with joy to the Lord all the earth, worship the Lord with gladness, come before him singing with joy. That God declares our, the way we are to come into his presence is with joy singing. That's why we start our service with singing. Not to kill time so late people can show up. Not to, you know, make it a smooth transition from this to that. But because that's how God has described and declared that we come to him. Every generation has its own ideas when it comes to, to music they enjoy and prefer. And this is inevitably going to impact our worship. You know, that the there's, there's just 
preferences that we have about music and the way it should go. And, and even from church to church, not just generationally, but the, the, the church over there might have a different preference in terms of how they do music. And over there, they might have a different preference in how they do music. And here we have a preference in the kinds of songs that we sing and, and all those kinds of things. And that's all good. There's nothing wrong with it, but we've got to be careful about that because our preferences can lead us into snobbery and into the wrong kind of an attitude. Here's how uh, Ed Taylor says it. If you're not careful, your preferences will make you a critic instead of a worshiper. You'll start to say things like, oh, they missed that note. Um, I don't really like that song. That's not, that's just, I don't, I, you know, yeah, okay, it talks about Jesus and how awesome he is, but I just don't like the, the melody just isn't that great or I, I don't like it or, oh man, they, uh, I wish they would do this this way or gosh, I, I hate when they add this to it or whatever. If you're not careful, your preferences will, will lead you into criticism instead of worshiping the Lord. You see, we sing because Jesus is worthy, not because of how we feel. That's why we sing to the Lord, because he is worthy of it. Now, there's a couple things I just want to point out to you about this singing. Um, uh, one, it was in the, the, the uh, section above this, but notice it says there in verse uh, 24 that they alternated group with group. So there was kind of this responsive type of singing going on where they would sing one part and then the other group would sing another part and they would kind of go back and forth, almost like an echo kind of a thing. That's one of the things that they did in terms of their style and, and what they did there. Also, something to, to think about it here is that the men were the ones leading in the worship. The, all these Levites, they're all dudes. Those are, in case you didn't know, those are all man names. Um, and uh, they're, they're the ones who are lead, the Levites singing. They're all men. I think that's an important thing. Men, we need to lead in this. Not say, well, I don't sing because I'm a guy. Well, that's not biblical. The, the men of the Bible sang. They lifted their voice to God, not because of, of what, the way it made them feel or what they enjoyed about it, but because they realized this is a sacrifice I can give to God. We turn up the volume here a little bit, so you don't have to be worried about whether or not you're on key, right? Let Vince worry about that. And uh, you just sing along, let your voice be heard with everyone else. Also, the, the sound that they made was joyful. That's another thing that we notice about this. Also, it was, it included instruments, right? There are some people who are like, the only way God likes music is if it's just our voices. And so if there's instruments, it's evil. Well, what do you got to say? There's like symbols here, right? Um, those aren't, those are, I guess it's an instrument, but they had other instruments. Later on, we'll see they had instruments from David, those kind of thing. Also, everybody participated. And what we see, we'll see in verse 43, it was loud. It was loud. And so there's just some things to note about the way that they were singing to the Lord. Look at verse 28. Not only do we see that uh, the idea of singing is a sacrifice of worship, but also the gathering was a sacrifice of worship. Look at what it says there. And the sons uh, of the singers gathered together from the countryside around Jerusalem. So they, they just, they gathered everybody. And this was something that they were calling the nation to, but these are the singers specifically, and they're gathering them together. And what I, what I would like to point out about that is that, that they, they made an effort to show up that they made gathering together a priority and that was a sacrifice of their worship, that they made their participation a priority. And so too it is with you and with me that in, instead of having an excuse to miss the gathering for worship, their gathering was the excuse to miss out on other things. They didn't say, well, I can't make it to, to uh, this, uh, this service to, together today because I've got this other thing happening. They, they said, no, I have, I have this gathering of God's people to go to, and so I can't do this other stuff. I have to do this. I, I'm gonna make this the priority. Hebrews 10, 25 says, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. You see, when your priorities are in line, then everything else comes after Jesus and your involvement in worshiping with God's people. One of the things just to let you know, as just you know, talking about in the beginning how we were gone last week, I just want to let you know that every time we're gone, my family and I are out of town, we always go to church somewhere. We, we're always found among God's people. We, we don't just say, oh, we're out of town. I guess we can skip out on, on being at church. No, we, we don't miss church, like ever. We're those weird people who are just always at church. And even when we're gone, 
we're still among God's people worshiping his name because gathering is a sacrifice of worship. Look at verse 30. Then the priests uh, and the Levites purified themselves and purified the people, the gates and the wall. Now here what we see is that the, the priests, they, they, we see there they purify themselves, the people, the gates, the wall. They, they go through this purification process and so what they would do is they would you know, get this water and they would have to do some certain things to it and make it, in order to make it purified. The way they purified themselves was with the ashes of a red heifer and then they would sort of baptize themselves in these baths and then they'd walk out saying these certain prayers and it's kind of this thing that they went through in order to do that. But the thing that I wanted to point out with this is that in, in connection with the idea of worship is that purity is a sacrifice of worship. That your dedication to purity is a sacrifice of worship. You see, they weren't content to be common or to be defiled. They were going to say, we, our very lives are going to be set apart as pure, as holy to God. We're going to be dedicated to the things of the Lord. And so, it, so too it is with us, that the time we spend sacrificing at the altars of our own sinful nature, our own sinful desires, or satanic temptation, or worldly pleasure, they make our souls filthy. All the time we spend on those things, it, it, it defiles us. It, it brings filth into our lives. And we need to be cleansed. We need to be purified. And there's only one way to scrub your soul clean. It's the blood of Jesus. It's the only way for your soul to be cleansed. It's not doing enough good things to outweigh the bad things. It's not taking a really hot shower. It's not, you know, trying to give enough money or uh, adopt enough rescue puppies. It's not going to do it. You've got to only come to this, the, the blood of Jesus as your means of scrubbing your soul clean. 1 John 1, 9 says it like this, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to do two things, forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. That when you bring your sin to Jesus and you recognize that it's an offense to him, whether or not you think it's wrong is beside the point, he does. Whether or not you think it's evil is beside the point, he does. And he's declared, this is wrong, this is evil, this is sinful. And when you say, I agree with you, Jesus, I am wrong, will you forgive me? Then he is faithful. He is just, he is right to bring you the forgiveness that your soul needs. And he goes further to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. What an amazing thing Jesus is able to do. What a miraculous thing that he alone is able to do. Stop carrying around your guilt and your shame. Stop carrying around your sin. Bring it to Jesus. He'll forgive you. He's not looking to crush you and destroy you. He's looking to forgive you and clean you and purify you. You see, purif purity comes from the work of Jesus. And this also demands our dedication to purity by running from whatever God says defiles us. Instead of jumping headlong into it and saying, well, Jesus will forgive me. We say, no, Lord, I don't want anything to do with it. You say it's wrong. You say it's evil. You say it defiles my soul. Help me to run from it instead of run to it. All right, verses 31 through 42, this is the biggest section that we'll read together. It says this, 31. So I brought the elders of Judah upon the wall and appointed two large Thanksgiving choirs. One went to the right hand on the wall toward the refuse gate. After them went uh, Hosh Hoshahiah and half the leaders of Judah. And Azariah, Ezra, Meshulam, Judah, Benjamin, Shemaiah, Jeremiah, and some of the priests' sons with trumpets, Zechariah, the son of uh, Jonathan, the son of Shemaiah, the son of Mataniah, the son of Melchiah, Melchiah uh, the son of Zakur, the son of Asaph, and his brethren, Shemaiah, Azrael, uh, Maalai, uh, Galai, Maai, Nathaniel, Judah, and Hanani, uh, with the musical instruments of David, what a cool thing to have there, the musical instruments of David. I, I don't know if, you know, it's like you get a handmade Martin guitar. I don't know if this is like a David instrument, you know. That's what I kind of think when I read that. But maybe it was just a, a copy of it. But maybe it was a handmade David guitar. Uh, all right. The man of God, Ezra the scribe, went before them, verse 37, by the fountain gate in front of them. They went up from the stairs of the city of David and on the stairway of the wall beyond the house of David, as far as the water gate eastward. Uh, the other Thanksgiving choir went the opposite way, and I was behind them with half the people on the wall. 
going toward the tower of the ovens as far as the broad wall and above the old, uh, oh, excuse me, the gate of Ephraim, above the old gate, above the fish gate, the tower of Hananel and the, the tower of the hundred as far as the sheep gate and stopped by the gate of the prison. So the two Thanksgiving choirs stood in the house of God. Likewise, I and half the rulers with me the, and the priests, El, uh, Eliakim, Maaseah, Minjamin, uh, Makahiah, uh, Eloniah, Zechariah, and Hananiah with trumpets. Also, Maasiah, Shemaiah, Eleazar, Uzi, uh, Je- Johananan, uh, Malchijah, Eliam, and Ezer. The singers sang loudly with uh, Jezariah, the director. Now, in this, what we see is that they're, they're gathering together and that there's these two Thanksgiving choirs that are put together and they're all orchestrated in terms of what they do. One choir, one large group goes one direction up on the walls of the city. Another group goes another direction up on the walls of the city and then they walk around and they meet in the temple area and they all, they're all singing and, and all of this is orchestrated together with uh, at the very end, you see there, Jezariah is the director. And so one of the things that I see in this as we see that in uh, the very beginning of it, Uh, verse 31. So I brought uh, the leaders of Judah up on the wall. All of this is organized together in order to pursue the Lord. That organized leadership is a sacrifice of worship. And that's what they're doing together today. That they've got all of this stuff all put together. And how do you have all of these guys with cymbals and trumpets and singers and different leaders and different levels of leaders and they're all doing all this stuff together. How does it not sound like noise? Organized leadership. The difference between noise and music has to do with organization. If it's brought together, if it's led well, if it's organized properly, then it's going to be worship instead of just noise. Now, notice that something I think is really great about this is that the wall that was once mocked as not being able to hold up a fox. Do you remember that from chapter four that uh, Tobiah said, uh, just mocking them, if a fox jumps on your wall, it's gonna crumble and fall down. They go, oh yeah? And they take hundreds of people and march them on the walls and sing and play instruments and it's shaking stuff. And they're like, the walls are strong because our God is strong and he made us possible to do all of this. Such a cool thing taking place here. Now, now in this, as we see all of this come together with all this organization put all together, the, the, one of the things I want to point out is that critical thinking and purposeful organization and detailed planning honor the Lord. These are things that are good. It's good to think ahead. It's good to think critically. Not, not being critical, but to think, how could we do that better? How could, we, how could we make this flow work more, uh, more eloquently together? And the people are all being prepared by all of this planning. Then they work together to honor the things of the Lord. You see, they require sacrifice and effort. They're not accidental things. You have to actually do them and sacrifice in order to make them happen. The planning and preparation and being led by the Holy Spirit, they're not enemies of one another. They work together. They work together. That, that you plan and prepare by the direction of the Holy Spirit and you also leave room for the Holy Spirit to m- interrupt your plans and, and you allow him to do what he's going to do. It's not one or the other, but it's both working together to bring God glory. Uh, we see that there are all of these different things from David's instruments and trumpets and singers and cymbals and stringed instruments all being directed together to make music instead of noise. Finally, we see in verses 43 through 47, our, our last principle of worship, it's this. Verse 44, and, uh, excuse me, 43. Also that day they offered a great, great sacrifices and rejoiced for God had made them rejoice with great joy. I love the way it says that. God made them rejoice with great joy. The women and the children also rejoiced so that the joy of Jerusalem was heard afar off. And at the uh, same time, some were appointed over the rooms of the storehouse for the offerings and the first fruits and the tithes to gather into them from the fields of the cities, the portions specified by the law for the priests and the Levites, for Judah rejoiced over the priests and the Levites who ministered. Both the singers and the gatekeepers kept the charge of their God and the charge of the purification according to the command of David and Solomon, his son. For in the days of David and Asaph of old, uh, were there were chiefs of the singers and songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. In the days of Zerubbabel, 
in the days of Nehemiah. See that there? Tying the past in with the present. And all Israel gave portions to the singers and the gatekeepers, a portion for each day. They also consecrated holy things for the Levites and the Levites consecrated for them, uh, them for the children of Aaron. The last principle to draw out in this is that generosity is a sacrifice of worship. The whole thing is talking about how the people were sacrificing to God and giving to God. And part of this celebration included their finances, both giving to God and giving for God's ministers. In verse 43, the sacrifices were not a source of pain and drudgery for them, but instead it provoked joy and gladness within the people. As they were giving to God, they did so like hilariously, joyfully, excitedly, giving and sacrificing to the Lord. That's what 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. That's not this, this obligation or drudgery or, gosh, I've got to give to God. Well, if that's your attitude, then just keep it. Like we, the Lord doesn't need it. That's not the point. The point isn't that God's going broke, and so if you don't give, then I can't buy a new jet. Like that's, that is not the point of giving. The, the point of giving is that it frees you from the idolatry of money. It gets you out of worshiping your finances. It gets you, you out of the self-centeredness that we all spiral into. And so giving to the Lord puts him in that place where we generously uh, use that as an act of worship. It'll only be joyful. Generosity will only be joyful when it's a response to the outrageous generosity that you've received from God. If you see it that God has generously given to you so much, then you can joyfully give. But if you don't see it that way, if you see it as this is, this is my money, it's my finances, it's my stuff, and God's trying to pry it out of my hands, then you're not gonna give joyfully. You're gonna see God as a thief instead of someone who, to whom you joyfully give. In verses 44 through 47, the provision of the priests and the Levites and the singers and the gatekeepers all came through the corporate worship of God. It's because worship must go deeper than a feeling and a song. It's gotta be who we are in every aspect of who we are. You see, we cannot choose the if of worship. We can only choose the object of our worship. Their worship involved sacrifice, and so too ours must involve sacrifice because there is no worship apart from sacrifice. So the question to leave you with today is which altar, altar will you sacrifice at? Where will you bring your sacrifice? Will you sacrifice uh, with your worship to the world? Will you sacrifice with your worship to your sinful flesh, your selfishness? Will you sacrifice at the altar of demons, satanic places, or will your sacrifice and your worship be given to Jesus? You see, what you choose to sacrifice for proves what you value. And if you don't purposefully select to sacrifice to Jesus, you will be sacrificing to something else, a false pagan God, and only Jesus is worthy of your worship. Will you worship him? Will you honor him? Will you glorify him? That starts with dedicating your life to him. And so if you haven't done that, today's the day to do it. Today's the day to give your life to Jesus. Or maybe you've wandered away from him and today's the day to come back to him, to return to him. So I just wanna encourage you to start there. Start with giving your heart wholly and completely to Jesus because he alone is worthy and let worship flow out of your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the opportunity to study it together, to understand what it is that you have to say. And we pray that you would help us to worship you that we wouldn't, we wouldn't uh, exclude sacrifice from our worship, but that we would see that it's a vital and intricate part of how we worship you. And so God, help us to worship you in, our, in sacrifice, to praise you with every aspect of our lives. And Lord, convict us of those areas where we hold ourselves back or we don't give ourselves completely and entirely to you and show us how we can step faithfully into sacrificing for you and serving you with our whole hearts for our whole lives. We pray together in Jesus' name. Amen.